Hello, my name is uh, Nick Robbins. Uh, I'm a professor in practice for Sustainable Finance at the London School of Economics at the Grantham Research Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you all today for this uh, webinar to explore the new publication, uh, A Toolbox for Sustainable Crisis Response Measures for Central Banks and Supervisors. Um, this is a joint publication um, by the London School of Econ Economics and, and SOAS, and I'll be joined by my co-authors, Simon Dickow and Uli Volz. This is produced through the INSPIRE program, and that's the International Network for Sustainable Finance Policy Insights Research and Exchange, uh, which is a network to uh, deliver uh, cutting edge research to help uh, central banks green uh, the financial system. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, co-chair INSPIRE along with Ilmi Granoff from the Climate Works uh, Foundation in, in the US. So uh, today we have a great uh, lineup for you. Um, after I've said my introductory words, um, my, uh, my co-authors, uh, Uli Voltz, who is the director of the SOAS Center for Sustainable Finance, and Simon Dickow, my colleague at the LSE, research officer and manager of uh, Inspire, they'll go through the key findings and recommendations of, of the toolbox. And then we're delighted to have three very distinguished uh, panelists uh, to respond and give their, their expert views about how central banks are dealing with uh, climate and uh, green finance issues uh, in the crisis, where the uh, toolbox could be useful for central banks and supervisors, uh, and what we need to focus on next uh, in terms of, of priorities uh, for action. So the first uh, panelist uh, will be uh, Luis Owasu Pereira de Silva, who is Deputy General Manager of uh, the Bank for International Settlement Settlements, also co-author of one of the best green finance uh, reports out recently, uh, The Green Swan, and Luis, you'll be delighted to hear that that was mentioned on our Asia webinar um, uh, by uh, Professor Ang Yao from Beijing University this morning. So welcome, uh, Luis. Uh, we'll then have uh, Rafael Del Villa Arrich, who is the Chief Advisor to the Governor of the Bank of Mexico, uh, Banco de Mexico, um, and a veteran of uh, G20 Green Finance and other initiatives. And then also Sonia Gibbs, Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at the in in Institute for International Finance, really becoming one of the key uh, uh, hubs for private uh, sector uh, sustainable finance uh, thinking. So that's that's the lineup. Then there'll be an opportunity for you on the call uh, to ask uh, your uh, questions. Please uh, put your questions and your comments in the chat uh, function. Um, we will. I will then draw from those. We won't unfortunately have the opportunity for, for you to give your questions verbally. This is going to be a recorded uh, webinar uh, and we'll make the links uh, available for you uh, to share um, afterwards with your, with your colleagues and others. So without more further ado, I'd like to to hand over to to Willie Volz um, to uh, start start us off and take us through the toolbox. Over to you, Willie. Thank you, Nick, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, before I uh, start the presentation with Simon, uh, I just want to highlight that this webinar is part of a research project on sustainable crisis responses of central banks and financial supervisors, uh, which is supported by the Inspire Network, and this project is jointly led by ESVG, uh, the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at Cambridge University, the CSEN Centre in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, the SOA Centre for Sustainable Finance. And there will be quite a lot of interesting events relating uh, to this topic uh, coming up over the next couple of months. So, uh, as mentioned, um, uh, we will present now the toolbox, um, which was a, a quick or kind of a, an attempt to um, respond quickly to the crisis, give some guidance, recommendations to central banks and supervisors in how to shape their responses in a sustainable way. Uh, and we've had quite a bit of interaction with the NGFS and, and uh, individual institutions uh, to, uh, in, in working on this. Central banks and supervisors are clearly playing a very important role in the current crisis response. And this relates both to the immediate stabilization phase where we're still in, uh, and uh, this will also extend to the recovery phase. And it's important to highlight that the policies that are adopted during the crisis will in many cases have very profound implications on long-term outcomes. So it's therefore important that the crisis response measures, even though they are geared towards uh, short-term immediate pressures, need to be consistent with long-term climate and sustainability goals, uh, 
and also that uh, the responses are aligned with a just transition to a sustainable economy. There are, broadly speaking, four reasons why central banks and supervisors uh, ought to incorporate climate and sustainability factors into their crisis responses. First of all, central banks need to make sure that they themselves don't load up all kinds of climate risk into their balance sheet uh, in their current actions. Of course, we know that central banks can't go bankrupt, um, but they need to be leading by example. Um, the NGFS has made very clear that uh, climate risks are a source of financial uh, instability um, and central banks in their current operations uh, need to take this into account. And this uh, matters, of course, in particular for uh, asset, uh, corporate asset purchase programs, um, which need to take climate risk into account. Secondly, central banks and supervisors need to make sure that the financial institutions they uh, supervise will not uh, build up all kinds of climate or sustainability risk in the current situation uh, when they're extending credit to keep the economy afloat. And of course, as guardians of uh, macro financial stability, central banks and supervisors also need to have a look at uh, systemic financial stability and uh, the economy at large and make, they need to make sure that um, the new um, credit and uh, financial flows that are being created now uh, don't uh, build up additional risk in the system. And last but not least, uh, as public bodies, central banks and supervisors uh, should be supporting um, the move towards uh, uh, sustainable financial system uh, that is aligned with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. So the prudential aspect is really important. Central banks uh, are right now creating enormous amounts of li liquidity to keep the economy and the financial system afloat. Uh, and also financial supervisors are using counter-cyclical uh, prudential instruments. And this is uh, very important indeed to, to um, uh, keep the economy alive, uh, support financial stability. Uh, but it's important that these actions don't lead to the build up of new sustainability related risks in portfolios uh, and balance sheets. Um, so uh, it is very important that the discussion central banks and supervisors have developed over the past couple of years um, about incorporating climate and other sustainability risks into their prudential actions uh, are not stopped now. Of course, we are in a crisis situation, so uh, one has to be very careful with overburdening uh, financial institutions with all kinds of new regulations, but um, we also need to be aware that uh, the climate crisis we are already facing um, is not giving us the luxury of uh, waiting another five years uh, to get serious about uh, climate risk. Next one, please. Yeah, so luckily there are uh, quite a lot of uh, tools and instruments that both central banks and supervisors uh, can use to calibrate their uh, crisis responses in a climate and sustainability aligned way. Uh, and I'm just going to mention four important ones and Simon will then go through uh, details of, of the toolbox. So first of all, um, central banks can adjust collateral frameworks to account for climate and other sustainability related financial risks uh, by applying, for example, haircuts or excluding uh, assets that are not aligned with sustainability goals. Um, refinancing operations can be aligned with sustainability goals. Uh, thirdly, reserve requirements and risk weights can be differentiated to account for climate risk or other risks. Um, and last but not least, asset purchase programs uh, could be, and I would very strongly suggest should uh, uh, be excluding carbon intensive assets um, in order to 
avoid a situation where um, central banks uh, provide a new lifeline uh, to uh, an industry which is really at the core of the problem in the climate uh, crisis. Uh, I'll hand over to Simon. Yes, um, thank you very much, Uli. I would like to, um, to quickly walk you through, through our toolbox in, in, in some detail. Um, well, first of all, of course, this, this toolbox has been informed by global experience. So we are very much aware that there's um, no one size fits all approach. And our toolbox reflects um, differing financial cultures, policy spaces, and objectives of, of central banks and supervisors around the world. So there are, there are two important aspects here. First, instruments that are seen as standards by some central banks may, of course, not be conventionally used by other central banks. And then secondly, central banks and supervisors across different jurisdictions um, operate within very different mandates and legal frameworks. So keeping this in mind, we, we have three over, um, overall areas in our toolbox, namely monetary policy, prudential policy, and other. And within these Three, um, three areas, we have nine policy instrument categories. And for each of these, of these categories or for each of these instruments, actually, we point out how a, convention, uh, a conventional sustainability blind calibration looks like, well, currently looks like, and how these instruments could be employed with a sustainability enhanced calibration. So the first category that we have is monetary policy. Here we have three subcategories, namely collateral framework, indirect monetary policy instruments, such as uh, open market operations and reserve requirements. Then we have non-standard instruments, including asset purchase programs, helicopter money, or even monetary financing. And then finally, we have um, direct monetary policy instruments, some of which can of course be used to, to affect the allocation of credit. So for most of these instruments, there, there are specific suggestions already for how they could be aligned with sustainability goals. Um, well, for, while for others, for example, collateral frameworks, um, these details are still being worked out. There's, there's also insp ongoing Inspire commissioned research on, on collateral frameworks, for example. Um, the second category that we have is um, financial regulation and supervision. Here we have microprudential instruments uh, including stress tests, disclosure, and other Basel III instruments. These can, of course, be um, aligned or can be calibrated to take account of environmental and climate change-related risks. For example, climate stress tests, mandatory ESG disclosure, and a climate risk-sensitive calibration of, for example, uh, differential risk-based capital requirements would, would be an option here. In the uh, macroprudential instrument category, we differentiate between cyclical instruments and cross-sectional instruments, which could, of course, also be calibrated to take systemic climate risk or environmental risk into account. Then finally, um, other policies. Here we have further financing schemes and initiatives, such as um, corporate financing facilities or loan guarantees and financial sector bailouts which could be made conditional on the reduction of uh, CO2 emissions or the focus on sustainability enhancing activities. Then we have the management of central bank portfolios where disclosure of climate related financial risks could be, could be an important first step for central banks to take. Um, the BIS also has a very nice paper on central banks foreign exchange portfolios and the relevance of climate risks. And then finally, we have um, supporting sustainable, well, um, support for sustainable finance activities, which should be rolled out and not, not be delayed in, in the face of the crisis. Um, yes, the emerging evidence base. So we, we tested our classification and toolbox empirically. We looked at all currently used crisis response measures that have been implemented by central banks and supervisors in countries with at least one NGFS member institution. And our investigation is based on the IMF's policy tracker. So we looked at around 60 countries. And an interesting finding is that most, if not all, of the instruments that we propose in our toolbox are currently used by central banks and supervisors, but not with a sustainability enhanced um, calibration. Uh, with regard to, to different instruments, well, on monetary policy, we, we found that many central banks have moved quickly to extend their collateral frameworks 
to include a broad variety and quality of assets. So that, that has been implemented by, by quite a few central banks in, in, that we looked at. And then secondly, on supervision, many central banks and supervisors have eased counter cyclical capital buffers and general um, microprudential regula um, regulation and supervisory standards. So, so, so these are two key findings. And um, while we have not been able to, to identify any monetary or prudential crisis response instruments that have been calibrated in a sustainability enhanced way, there are of course also some positive examples of monetary and financial authorities that are advancing sustainab uh, their, their sustainability ag agenda despite the challenges of COVID-19. For example, their ongoing efforts in China, then um, there, there has been the launch of a sustainable finance uh, of a sustainable finance committee and frameworks in Mexico and, and the Philippines. BCB has of course joined the, the NGFS earlier this year, and then there have been uh, well, numerous reports have been published by the NGFS, by the ECB, by the Banque de France. So in this in this last category, this is where we where we find currently a lot of activities. Um, two interesting initial conclusions from this from this report. First, many changes have not been well. Many policy changes have not been fully implemented yet, and the dynamic nature therefore provides considerable scope for central banks and supervisors to to retrofit sustainability factors into their crisis response instruments and broader policy measures. And then, secondly, this policy response also demonstrates, we would argue, that a broader set of instruments is potentially at the disposal. Um, of, of central banks and supervisors, and this to some degree renders the ongoing debate redundant regarding the, avail the availability of a number of, of these rather unconventional measures. Because some of these, um, of, of, of these instruments are currently used, well, that are currently used, have been discussed by central banks and supervisors in the past as not being suitable to allow, uh, to, to, to allow addressing the greening of, of, of growth and economies. Um, yes, and, and quite a few of these of these rather unconventional or, or um, yeah, unconventional instruments have now been used or ha have been calibrated to support specific sectors, mostly the SME sector. And uh, well, this for us bears the question of whether this creates some kind of policy space and an opportunity to green central banking and scale up green finance now and to further include climate risks into, into binding regulation. Yes, one last slide we have. So uh, we, we are planning to have one more webinar uh, in, in July. Uh, the date will be announced soon to also discuss this, this, this uh, toolbox within the European framework. That's it from my side. Over, over to Nick and the panelists. Well, thanks very much, Uli and Simon. Very good overview. I'd just like to pick up that last uh, couple of comments as you made, um, Simon, that I think because of the dynamic nature of this um, crisis that we have before us in terms of the economic shock of, of, of COVID, there are opportunities uh, for central banks and supervisors to incorporate uh, sustainability and climate factors um, in, in, in perhaps the next phase. Um, and also there's been a, an interesting demonstration of, of many of the tools that are in the toolbox potentially giving um, some opportunity to add a green dimension in the next, in the next round. So we're going to move uh, to, uh, the, the, to our panelists, our, our three panelists. And uh, Luis, if I could uh, turn to you, uh, it'd be very good to have your views on how you see uh, central bank supervisors trying to think about uh, climate green finance issues uh, in the crisis. Your views indeed on the, on the toolbox and perhaps sort of where you would focus attention in terms of priorities. So Lise, over to you for the first word, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, um, thank you Nick. Look, first, uh, thank you for having me in this, uh, this webinar and uh, um, I congratulate uh, the work of Inspire of uh, you and your colleagues on, on putting together uh, this, uh, this, uh, this paper. Uh, I, I, <clears throat> I see a lot of, um, in terms of the mapping uh, of uh, this uh, toolkit, uh, some similarities between uh, work. I think, as uh, as Ulrich and Simon pointed out, uh, this work and uh, some of the areas of interest of the uh, NGFS, particularly the last uh, report uh, uh, 
of uh, of uh, last of this month actually on uh, <clears throat> the uh, monetary policy uh, channels with which uh, instruments can be uh, used to uh, uh, contribute to uh, uh, fighting climate change. Uh, my my take, uh, uh, guys, is that um, uh, we are. I mean, we ourselves looked at. Uh, the issue before the crisis. I mean, the way in which uh, um, central banks were interested or should be interested in uh, climate change related risks uh, was uh, uh, analyzed by, <clears throat> by us before COVID-19. In the more broader uh, context uh, of uh, what we perceived were the uh, mounting physical and transition risks that were appearing in financial markets. And because of the financial stability mandate of central banks, they had a particular interest in looking at these uh, risks. But what we, the angle we took, uh, uh, and, and this is perhaps one of the difficulties that uh, Simon uh, pointed at, is that um, we wanted to make sure that um, in uh, addressing these risks related to financial stability, uh, central banks would not become uh, a sort of uh, uh, only game in time again for, for climate uh, change related uh, risks. Why is it so? Because our approach pointed to uh, the need for a broad encompassing coordinated approach to uh, uh, many actors pulling together in the direction of designing uh, policies that would uh, have a financial stability component, but would need to have many other dimensions of coordination, particularly with uh, the private sector, uh, governments, uh, using instruments that would go, let's say, beyond even the toolkit that you have uh, pointed out. And perhaps one of the uh, uh, delicate balances that uh, you yourself point to, which is the fact that some, some instruments that are in your toolkit do exist, but are not necessarily used today with a calibration for policies that are directly related to climate change risk is precisely because of this uh, uh, need that we pointed out to uh, uh, not to focus or not to put excessive burden into the community of uh, central banks, but to try to balance the response in a broader array of instruments that would involve more responsibility to governments, fiscal policy, civil society, and so on and so forth. So I think, in a nutshell, guys, the, the jury is out whether you can sort of create a balance where the central bank community would indeed uh, look into climate uh, change related risks and uh, uh, look at it uh, in terms of their financial stability mandate and uh, pick some of the instruments in your toolkit that certainly address this financial stability concern and mandate, for example, in terms of uh, disclosure of uh, uh, risky assets, in terms of some of the macroprudential and microprudential tools that you, you have identified, but would not necessarily venture into uh, going, I think uh, Uric was advocating very strongly for, let's say, green QE. Uh, but my take here is that the community has uh, especially resisted going to this direction because of, let's say, uh, the, the uh, excessive or uh, uh, well, the additional distortion that this might uh, uh, create. The fact that it would be perhaps in some cases counterintuitive to have uh, expansionary policies and accommodative policies that would be selected for specific categories of assets. And these types of uh, delicate uh, balance that uh, a sort of uh, 
a more aggressive use of the tools at the hands of the community would, uh, would create in terms of market perceptions and, and market reaction, okay? So I, my, my, my take here is that because of this uh, uh, complex, uh, delicate balance, uh, then the, uh, the, the way in which uh, we, we, we thought of this was uh, to try to look at uh, some of the, um, the tools that would sort of, or the, the areas that would uh, be compatible with central bank mandates, would help address climate uh, change related risks, uh, but would still uh, make sure that uh, uh, do, do not necessarily put uh, the, the central banking community in the exclusive driver seat. So let me give you some examples where the, the work, and again, it's not contradictory with having a, a, a map, a, a very detailed toolkit as, as, you, as you put out. It's just like uh, the way in which the tools are used and the, the rationale behind using them and the rationale that makes sure that it's coordinated with, with, with other policies. For example, um, the, the, the capacity for central banks to improve uh, uh, their modeling of climate-related uh, 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 risk, physical risks and transition. How do they transmit into uh, uh, the, uh, the financial systemic risk in, in markets? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the way in which you can, you can design portfolios with a green premium, with, with this, with, with this uh, and to, to a broader extent with ESG criteria, that would be also a way to sort of factor in a, a lower carbon print type of portfolio for financial institutions. Um, the way in which, for example, uh, you look at um, the work of uh, uh, reputation and disclosure into uh, uh, the, the pricing of, uh, of assets. So many things that are happening uh, in the Basel Committee, in the uh, Financial Stability Board, in the NGFS, in the central bank community, that uh, certainly uh, picks on uh, some of the uh, uh, tools that you have in your toolkit, but do not necessarily uh, put the, um, the responsibility of, uh, of using in a uh, very specific uh, way and explicit way some of uh, the tools that are meant to be uh, of a broader use because of this political e economy argument where uh, by doing that, by becoming uh, a uh, sort of uh, driver in the process rather than a, a part of a more coordinated approach that uh, encompasses uh, particularly fiscal policy and, and carbon pricing, which are uh, decisions that do not pertain to central banks, you would, uh, uh, to some extent, be undermining the whole, I mean, not necessarily, undermining is a bit of a strong word, Nick. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather sort of not necessarily being the best incentive in this uh, uh, necessary uh, uh, um, uh, effort that all of us have to make to, to combat uh, climate change. So I stop here. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Very, very, uh, very profound comments, I think. And I think one of the things what maybe we'll have time to catch up on, I think one of the, the interesting themes at the moment is obviously a number of countries are not just introducing sort of crisis stabilization measures, but now thinking about longer term recovery plans. And I think that's potentially where we do obviously see uh, the potential for that broader coordination between fiscal policy, both on the spending side, but also potential introduction of carbon pricing on, on the capital, on, the, on, the, on the, the revenue raising side. So thank you for those. Um, uh, Rafael, if I may turn to you in, in Mexico uh, City, um, I can see your tree outside your window. Um, if, uh, if you could give us your thoughts, uh, sitting inside a, a, a central bank uh, and, uh, and how you're looking at linking these two agendas of sort of crisis response and, and green finance and, and your views indeed on, on the toolbox itself. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you everybody uh, for, for this, inv this invitation and great opportunity to, to be with you. Um, yes, I, 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 I very much like this tool, uh, and uh, so congratulations for, for bringing this discussion forward, and I think it's very, very useful and timely. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we, coming from an emerging market economy, I think um, it's, um, I, I would like to, to start stressing this, um, the third, um, the three other policies, you know, the number three that you have in the toolbox called other policies, because, um, and in particular focusing on, on the last of the, of these um, uh, other policies, which are called supporting sustainable finance. Um, um, and um, I think it's um, uh, important for central banks, uh, as Luis uh, mentioned, that we are not um, doing this alone in any way, uh, that we are coordinated with other financial authorities and with the private sector in, in doing that. And I think um, there are, of course, by now, significant examples of of that uh, in the UK and other parts uh, of the world. Uh, so, so, so this is a very fundamental point because you have to sort of start building the institutional setup um, and, the, and the policies in that, that are the competence of different authorities. So it's, this is a, a little bit of a repetition, um, but, but, um, but it should be underlined uh, particularly in in emerging markets, so so it, in and the conclude at the conclude the concluding recommendation that the Banco de Mexico issued when presenting its um, quarterly report and this was uh, um, done um, in late April um, uh, was that the microeconomic functioning of the economy needs to be strengthened and domestic uncertainty must be reduced in order to improve the country's um, business uh, um, perception. No? And uh, I think this um, last recommendation in the, in the quarterly report um, is very fundamental um, because you tie that to, to the, um, that was already mentioned that climate change is a source of financial stability, st stability as mentioned by the NGFS and that um, uh, and that financial systems uh, play a crucial role in protecting economic activity. No, no. Of course, this is a, this is a role of insurance, um, but um, very to to very clearly insurance. Uh, uh, just to make an example, can impact allocation of investments and support the internalization of externalities. So, for instance, um, policies in gearing up towards um, avoiding catastrophes by um, firms, say uh, mining firms, to, to put an example, um, a, insurance can play a, a fundamental role in making increasing awareness of the um, corporates of um, the risk of catastrophes and uh, how and uh, therefore on the type of um, investments and asset allocations uh, that are needed within the corporate um, to to precisely reduce the probability of such catastrophe. So so this is an example that I I am putting of the insurance, but. Um, when we are looking at risk management in general, this is precisely the same, the same transmission mechanism that we have, namely when the, the proper accounting of brown and versus green assets, of um, the proper accounting of, of um, um, risk differentials and, um, prob um, and um, uncertainties involved and risks involved within the two assets, uh, su supports will support a change in the asset allocation. That is ultimately the goal of the toolbox. So, so, so let me um, just um, briefly uh, ex um, show, transmit to you, you know, the, the logic that was made 
in creating, you know, the logic behind creating the Sustainable Finance Committee. And that was uh, presented to the Financial Stability Council in the country at the end of March and uh, whose uh, rules of operation are, are currently in the process and probably even today will be approved. Um, so the, the idea behind this Financial Stability Committee being part of the, um, uh, sorry, the Financial Sustainable Committee being part of the uh, Council for Financial Stability was that we wanted to have a look at not only as a reaction to um, risks, short-term risks, but we wanted in this uh, Financial Stability Council looking at longer-term risks uh, affecting the economy. And, uh, and also, uh, uh, and in doing so, um, we, um, it, the notion was put forward that we need essential, um, uh, uh, it is very important precisely to develop a sustainable finance roadmap um, um, uh, to, to inform uh, the infrastructure and instruments that uh, should be available um, in Mexico's financial system. And by infrastructure, I mean, and the taxonomies, the disclosure and reporting. Um, um, and um, so, so going to, to, to just um, on the side, mentioning briefly the, um, um, the report that was issued uh, in the second half of May, this uh, last past month, um, on, this was a UN and Banco de Mexico report. Um, one of the conclusions um, is that, uh, and we were surprised that um, uh, the TCFD recommendations, for instance, were very, you know, we expected them to be very well known, are known only to 75% of credit institutions and to a little bit less than half of asset managers in the country. So, so basic, um, and, and so uh, we have committed to, um, is, uh, to pu push forward an agenda of capacity building and, um, and uh, transparency disclosure um, along the lines of the TCFD. No? Um, this is, of course, going to be a, fund a fundamental part of the sustainable finance roadmap um, going forward. No? So um, all this to say um, that um, a lot has to be done in terms of building the stone, the, core, the basic stones of the building. And the basic stones of the building are precisely this. No? Um, um, using, using, looking also to leverage the um, certifiers, the uh, second opinion providers, all this um, ec ecosystem of corporates that give credibility to uh, and assess um, the, 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 the allocations, uh, the asset allocations. Uh, and just to finish, a quick comment on financial materiality. I think this is an absolutely essential point uh, to be um, uh, uh, probably sh um, should receive further highlight within the toolbox because um, um, uh, it, it is not a, that we are sort of looking as uh, uh, this issue as a value uh, proposition. It is we are looking at this the issues in the toolbox from from because they are they make sense. They are they are uh, fundamental to the analysis. And so when when you propose um, collateral um, frameworks or you discuss collateral frameworks or you discuss um, 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 a, 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 you know, a microprudential or macroprudential instruments. I think the, the discussion 
should be very much embedded in uh, this uh, concept of financial materiality. Um, thank you very much. And I stop with you. Very good, Raphael. Um, very, very interesting comments. It was good to have the update about actually what's happening in, um, in, in Mexico and good to see that your new initiative is, has not been uh, kicked off course or blown off course uh, by the crisis itself and you've, you've kept going, which is very good. So, Sonia, if I could come to you, uh, the last of our uh, respondents. Um, clearly, you're sitting at the IAF, really a hub of thinking from the private sector views on these things. Many, many Obviously, many of your members and yourselves have been thinking very deeply about uh, crisis response. It'd be good to get your perspective, essentially, sort of at, at one step removed, perhaps, from the direct um, sort of central banks on on this on this agenda, and indeed your your thoughts on the toolbox and where you would prioritise action. So, Sonia, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And and indeed, you know, I think one of the most striking things in in response to the the toolbox paper and the discussion today has been the continued focus and momentum on sustainable finance in the policy and regulatory community. It's it's really quite quite uh, astonishing considering how much else has to be done with pandemic response. So, but I wanted to start by saying that central banks and supervisors have in many ways, of course, been bracing for this type of crisis for, for some time now on different levels, both in terms of traditional risk to financial stability, you know, debt overhang, credit risk, and so on, but also these newer climate related risks. And I feel it's incumbent upon me to say on the financial stability front, of course, the reforms that were put in place after the last crisis have helped contain systemic risks and the financial sector is better capitalized with better buffers in place and so on. And on the climate front here, I would sort of highlight, of course, the work of the central banks and supervisors network for greening the financial system in laying the groundwork for addressing these climate risks, the new guides for supervisors, the climate scenarios, as was discussed and just had just come out. The different work streams on supervision, macro financial risk, mainstreaming sustainable finance. You know, all of this is very helpful to firms in developing a framework for assessing disruption from climate and broader ESG risks. So for example, in a COVID context, you could think of these in terms of shocks to food supply chains, for example. So all of this has been tremendously helpful and the, the more recent work, of course, on ensuring the private sector can effectively generate the kind of information that's needed for supervisors for risk assessments. So this focus on better disclosure and, and better reporting. And here I would um, sort of emphatically second the, the remarks that, that uh, Raphael made on, on financial materiality, very, very critical. Um, as we at the, the IIF and our members are uh, very much have a focus on the need for global alignment in uh, sustainable finance policy and regulation. I'd also highlight the role of the traditional standard setters. So the Ball Committee on, on Banking Supervision, the new Task Force on Climate Related Financial Risks, the work of the FSB, uh, the IAIS on insurance side, IOSCO, all of this uh, we feel is, is fundamental to, to making a well-aligned uh, global framework. I'd highlight IOSCO as well on, on emerging markets because I think that's a dimension that's often overlooked in these discussions with so much of the focus being on conditions in, in mature markets, the setting for emerging markets, especially if you wanna build back better, you know, it's critical to avoid very carbon intensive recovery, which is the traditional model for, for many emerging markets. So just to highlight that there. Um, on the... Um, the monetary policy front, I think another lens for exploring this um, crisis response. Um, you know, it, it's fair to say that very little has been done to date on using monetary policy tools to achieve specific sustainability objectives. So your toolbox in this context, I think is, is, is very helpful. Um, you know, it, when you look at the broader fiscal response to the, to the crisis to date, if you do all those calculations, probably less than, than 1% has been allocated toward a specific green objective. So highlights the distance we have to travel. Um, I did, however, want to highlight some of the findings from a recent survey of reserve managers that we did uh, with Morgan Stanley, which is kind of been encouraging in, in how central banks are looking at um, their own work and in greening their own portfolios. First to say that over half of the reserve managers we surveyed are members of the NGFS or TCFD or considering 
becoming so. Half of the respondents of these reserve managers already manage green, social, or sustainability-linked bonds, and many intend to increase their exposure in the next couple of years. Uh, and many are considering ESG as an additional dimension for their liquidity and returns and capital preservation framework. And uh, finally, many of the reserve managers are beginning to set explicit ESG or sustainable investing goals as part of their reserve management strategy. So I think the, in the context of the, the toolkit that, that you've uh, laid out, I think some of these elements are beginning to, to come together. Um, just in, in, you know, aside from the sheer admiration from all of the work that's gone into this, this toolkit, uh, a lot of very interesting proposals. So congratulations for, for putting that together. Uh, it's very ambitious, clearly, setting out ways for central banks to become more actively engaged in, in directing capital to climate-friendly economic activities. And here, I think it's probably quite important to emphasize the, the political dimension to this, right? Because in order for this to happen, there has to be the, the political will to do so. Um, and another factor to take into consideration is the, the classic you know, tragedy of the horizon um, question. You know, we still don't have the data and the tools to quantify these risks and put them in the here and now, you know, so making a clear case for urgent action. Um, and so what you're doing is, is really geared toward effectively extending the mandate of central banks. And again, you know, the political will to do this in a globally aligned manner will be, will be very important. Um, so when thinking about areas like risk weights and prudential treatment, uh, I'd highlight some key missing fundamentals. Just a few here, the, the data gaps, uh, climate risk assessment being evolving, a very nascent field. We still need to build agreement on metrics and methodology. Otherwise, you're comparing apples, oranges, and bananas in, in different jurisdictions. It makes it very difficult to, to build that sound policy framework. The lack of consistent definitions and classifications, both around what is sustainable finance, for example, from the point of view of a bank doing lending activities, but also in the investment space. So, uh, you know, there are hundreds of definitions of sustainable or responsible investment, so important to, to bring those together. And all that, of course, feeds into the lack of a coherent disclosure framework. So another very important point. Um, we haven't really sort of delved into this, but sort of as on a related note, a central issue is the lack of a global carbon price. So without that, you know, making the risk assessment of risk differentials obviously becomes much harder when you don't have that. And finally, we'd be cautious on the notion of kind of green supporting brown penalizing factors. And again, for some of these same reasons around the missing fundamentals for a common understanding of, of what green is, what brown is, and what's in between. So as you say in the report, a lot of very interesting work ahead. So on the, the what next and, and recommendations, I would just sort of make three main messages here. First of all, you know, we, we don't expect and, and would not anticipate any kind of a return to a pre-crisis sustainable finance policy agenda. Clearly, it's going to be broadened. Many of the elements of the toolkit that you set out are, are geared to, to move toward the mainstream, and but we would advocate that these build be built out in collaboration with industry. So in this very new and evolving field of climate and environmental risk assessment, doing it uh, in collaboration is going to produce much better outcomes. We're still in the learning by doing stage. Um, second is to, to really guard against the risk of fragmentation or lack of alignment in the supervisory framework. A lot of individual institutions are undertaking independent climate risk assessment efforts, kind of a climate uh, arms race, you might say. It's good to have healthy and, and uh, positive competition, but too much, too much divergence in objectives, design considerations, and methodologies are really gonna make it hard, especially for global firms that operate in multiple jurisdictions. So avoiding fragmentation is key. And finally, I think, you know, investigating and, and building out new instruments, vehicles to factor ESG considerations into debt markets more broadly, including importantly in the context of, of debt sustainability. So scaling up the use of things like social bonds, transition bonds, SDG bonds, and so on, really growing 
these markets in support of sustainable growth. So well done, it's great, uh, great report. Thank you. Well, Sonia, thank you so much uh, for closing on those, those, those comments from your Self and Raphael and, and, and Luis. Um, we, the one thing I've, I've learned from all these things is that time is a non renewable resource, and we have uh, s about sort of seven minutes uh, to go. Um, I would be interested, actually, um, Uli and uh, Simon, on your sort of brief reflections just on what you've heard from, from our, our speakers. We've had a couple of very interesting comments, I think, from the, from the chat. Uh, Olaf Faber at um, University of Waterloo in Canada, really talking about sort of how do we uh, convince uh, central banks about, about sustainability at time of crisis, and also from Stephen Rothstein at a series, I believe, in, in Boston, sort of really talking about sort of which should of the recommendations in the, in the toolbox we should prioritize. And then I'll, I'll come back um, uh, to the three panelists at the end. And then there's a, a very good question from Kevin Gallagher, which I'll try and uh, pick up uh, as, as, we, as we close. But um, just a couple of comments from you, um, and then I'll come back to the three panelists and then we'll, we'll finish up. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll take over. Um, thanks so much to, to all the discussions. Uh, there's really a lot of uh, stuff in there. Um, just a few points. So first of all, I'd like to clarify Louise said, I was not advocating green QE. In fact, I have been very long, for very long arguing that green QE is, is not really what we need. Uh, so what I have said is that uh, central banks when conducting asset purchase programs should be excluding uh, very carbon intensive assets. So that's a very important distinction. It's not green QE, which I know in the central banking community is a non-starter. Um, and also, I mean, if you look at the green bond universe, you know, there isn't really enough uh, green bonds anyway. But uh, there is a very important uh, problem when we have uh, the most important central banks in the advanced uh, world who have uh, a very substantial asset purchases uh, of, of fossil fuel companies and so on. Um, so I think this has to be addressed. Um, I would also like to very much echo the point uh, Sonia made about uh, the need for, for disclosure. And uh, I would indeed argue that right now is the uh, moment where central banks and supervisors should uh, make clear their plans to make um, disclosure mandatory um, very soon. So, um, and this is an important point more generally. Um, I think we all agree that uh, this point in time, it's difficult to put all kinds of new burdens on uh, financial institutions, uh, but uh, it's very important that central banks and supervisors lay out a clear path, um, and this path has to include mandatory disclosure, because without uh, a disclosure of climate and other sustainability risks, uh, we will be having these discussions about, well, we can't really do anything uh, unless we have these data. And uh, so it will take ages and we do need these data. So um, man, uh, mandatory disclosure has to be part of the strategy and also uh, setting out uh, very clear timelines regarding uh, climate stress testing. Um, so supervisors need to set very clear expectations and uh, this will have anticipatory effects. So financial institutions, if they're being told, um, uh, if they're being told uh, from next year on, uh, you'll have to, to uh, report to your supervisor uh, what you have in your balance sheet. Uh, then, of course, this will affect uh, current lending and investment decisions. So that's a very important point. Uh, on Kevin Gallagher's point on the just transition, I know Nick will, will pick up on that. Uh, but I think um, uh, central banks can do indeed quite a lot to support, and, and many are doing a lot to support the SME sector, for example. Um, and uh, so there's quite uh, a lot of uh, things, special facilities that, that could uh, be made up for, for kind of job intensive uh, support to the economy, which would be an important element of a just transition. Um, but of course, uh, here the interaction with uh, uh, public uh, uh, finance is also very important. And just very final point before Nick cut, cuts me off. Um, uh, it's really important, Simon mentioned it, but uh, we have of course um, in the world, uh, central banks with a lot of different uh, mandates, different uh, monetary frameworks and so on. Uh, 
So in this toolbox, we've put together a list of all kinds of different tools uh, that different central banks and supervisors are using. And we're not saying that everyone should be using everything. There are different monetary traditions, and certainly the Reserve Bank of India is doing certain things that, uh, let's say, for the Bundesbank would not be really uh, uh, felt appropriate. Um, so there are different options. Um, and uh, so it's different, uh, difficult to say, well, everyone should be doing this or that, except for uh, these rather general points that I make. Thank you. Thanks, Ulrich. Um, Simon, any, any, any quick comments? No, I'm fine. I think Uli already addressed the, the major points. I'm happy to give the rest of the time to the, to the panel. Very generous of you, I must say. Um, uh, Luis, um, a closing thought for you um, in terms of how we might take this work forward? I think uh, what uh, <clears throat> Uric was saying is precisely the, uh, the key points. Uh, having a, a, ve a very useful set of options, but understanding that uh, uh, there, there needs to be coordination. I think Sonia said that too, with the private sector, with governments, and that therefore, let's say, it is a, a joint effort in terms of uh, having partners uh, that work towards the same goal, which is to reduce uh, uh, climate change uh, related uh, uh, risk in a way that sort of encompasses and uses the tool with skills, but also respecting some of the specificities and mandates of the institutions and actors that have to play a role uh, with all their uh, sort of uh, uh, might and determination, but with, let's say, a, a complex uh, political economy that we know around the world. Very, very helpful, Luis. Thank you. And, 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 and Raphael, your, your closing reflections on where we might go next? No, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think very, very inspiring. I already, I very much enjoyed also the comments that Ulrich made. Um, because I think, um, yes, um, and uh, Sonia, on disclosure, and I would uh, emphasize taxonomy, this common language. What are we talking about? No, uh, so we, we, we cannot, and I fully support Sonia's point in the trying to avoid the fragmentation, global fragmentation of methodologies and practices at this very basic infrastructure level. So, so I think, um, um, uh, we, at least uh, we, in Mexico, we have it pretty clear that we, we want to, to be um, uh, having a tropicalization of these concepts to make them uh, tuned to our reality, but that we have to be very mindful of where the rest of the world is moving because we, the corporates are, are global and we need to, to, um, to make sure that we do not uh, impose a cost uh, on this uh, uh, on the system that, that would be self-defeating. Thank you. Well, that was a fantastic phrase, I must say, Raphael, the tropicalization of green finance. I'm sure we're going to have a session specifically on that. So thank you very much. And, and Sonia, a closing, a closing thought from yourself? Just to say that, you know, being at a point where we have defined climate risk as financial risk has utterly transformed. You know, I've been working in this industry for for 30 years now, utterly transformed the industry. We are not going back to kind of uh, pre-climate awareness or pre-COVID measures and, and now in incorporating a social dimension to it post-COVID. I, th I think this is really going to emphasize the need for working hand in hand with the public sector to scale up the kind of financing we need to address these, these risks. Well, thanks, Sonia. If I may uh, uh, follow on what you just said to answer the question from Kevin Gallagher about uh, in our paper, we, just, we touch on this issue of the just transition. And I, I think one of the things we will learn in this post-COVID sustainable finance agenda is that the social dimension, I think, will be, will be stronger. Uh, we've been working with investors, with commercial banks, and also with development banks about how they can uh, support a just transition. So green objectives with, uh, with social inclusion uh, as well. Um, and my sense is there is a role also for central banks and supervising this, not least those central banks who have a dual mandate, uh, looking both at financial stability and also at employment. So there's an, an agenda for us to, to look at. Thank you, all of you who listened for your questions. Um, also for Hugh Chenet, who uh, are... Thanks to our panelists, to Mr. Raphael and, and Sonia.
Um, and really would be delighted if you could continue the discussion, uh, send us your comments. Uh, we intend to, to take this work forward and build on all the comments we've had today. So many thanks. I'd also like to thank Nasha um, at uh, LSE, who's been helping setting this up, uh, and also Juliet Phillips at E3G, who's uh, been behind the, the setup of this webinar. So thanks to everyone, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.